What's happening, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns, BDGE's very own Dynasty show. We've had some pretty decent content recently in terms of what the NFL has been doing, like drafting and you know, that live stream that basically took our life away. But uh, we decided because the draft has passed, a lot of people are now starting up Dynasty Leagues. So we figured why not talk about how you should actually run a league, how you can get into a league, the different settings you can have. And I just realized I forgot to introduce you, Mike. So I kind of feel like an <laughs> asshole. So uh, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing good, man. Uh, I think it's going to be, this will be a good one because, uh, you know, everyone's kind of getting into startup season now. So this is a little, a little bit of like an evergreen piece where, you know, you can kind of walk through and learn like how we think about it. Cause uh, I mean, I'm not going to say I'm a pro, but like I've been doing but this. You are. I've, You're been joining, I've joined so many leagues to the point where I've seen like what works and what's really shitty. So hopefully we can help you fade some of those big grenades. Yeah, and if you want to fade some of these big grenades, plug in it right now, the Discord. Uh, a lot of the ways that you can find these rules, uh, not as in-depth as we're going to go in this video, but it gives a good outline. It's also a way to find leagues is our Discord channel. It'll be linked in the description. It will be the first comment that'll be pinned there. Completely free to join. You get to talk to a bunch of different people. You get to talk to us. You get a bunch of different opinions on your trades and whatnot, but that's not what this is about. This is about getting into Dynasty Leagues, but before we do that, we have to do one very important thing, Mike, and what is it? Hit the intro. Proud to announce that we will be having the very first inaugural Bunk Bed Breakdowns Listener League. So you will be able to compete directly with Noah and I. We will be co-owning a team, which will probably be a shit show because we both like different players, but it will be fun for you. And um, we're, we're, like, we're going to follow a lot of these settings that uh, we kind of outline here as well um we didn't really determine like how we want to pick the order so we'll just kind of do that on the fly right now um what are, what are you thinking i'm thinking they leave reviews in the itunes store mm -hmm. give us five stars or four stars <laughs> i mean probably probably wouldn't be good to leave four stars but uh leave what you like about the show what we can improve upon uh definitely better audio quality from my end needs to be had or tweet us with the hashtag bunk bed breakdowns and give us a review of the show and we'll pick 11 of you guys randomly to join our league it'll be I think it's going to be a $50 buy-in, but it'll be 75 year one like we discussed yeah. earlier in the league. We didn't want to make it too expensive, so it didn't you know, cater to a lot of people. Uh, we think 50 is like a good spot. So it's 75 year one, then 50 every year thereafter. And like Mike said, it's going to be a lot of these same settings. Uh, we're going to do a startup draft. We'll probably do a separate rookie draft because we all know we love to draft and be degenerates <laughs> in that sort of way. So uh, yeah, hit us up in either one of those two ways. And then next week on the show, we will announce – the winners and then we'll start out from there we'll hit you up on discord or on twitter however you guys reached out to us um, and get that league started as quickly as we can hopefully you guys have fun in that league and hopefully you guys can have the claim to fame of taking us down yeah you probably will because all i do is donate <laughs> money so you guys will probably win i, I love punting your one uh, that's like my favorite thing to do So first things first, uh, this is probably a step that most people skip. Um, I don't because I think it's pretty important. I like to be, uh, I like to have rules set in place so that there's very little left for like discretion. So people can't complain later. So usually what I do when I start commissioning leagues, I'll draft up a, some bylaws. Um, and you know, everyone drafts up their bylaws differently. Like, but you know, a lot of people cover like the same stuff, like, you know, draft, like rules, trading payments, and all that stuff. But it's just like a good place for you to go and for everyone in the league to go and like basically get all their questions answered right away. And that way, if something happens and someone says like, Hey, like, why don't you do it this way? You'd be like, well, you signed up those bylaws when you joined the league. So suck it up. Yeah. It's a really good reference point. If somebody is complaining about like a different trade or some other like scoring setting, it's like, all right, just read the thing that I wrote three years ago when we first started this league. And yeah, as you said, it's a really good reference point. It basically lays out most of the things we're about to touch on right now. So uh, yeah, you definitely want to start there. I know Flea Flicker allows you to put like a huge blurb on the main chat. I'm not sure if Sleeper lets you do that, yeah. but it's really helpful that you can just go to the home screen and you'll see like all of the league rules and everything like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so team team, uh, what's it called? What's that thing called? Flea flicker. Yeah. Flea flicker. Yeah. Flea flicker and MFL allows you to do it too. What I do is I just, I just literally write up a little Google docs and everyone I'm recruiting people or people are joining, I send them the Google docs and I say like, read this entire thing and agree before you actually join. If you guys want examples of what like a bylaw looks like, you know, shoot me a note on discord or Twitter. Happy to send you mine. You can just copy paste and tailor it to whatever you guys want to do because it's a lot of work to write up in the beginning. But once you have one, you kind of just like tailor it, the scoring for whatever league you want to start. 
Yeah. And we'll start a new channel. We'll link one of those if you're fine with that, Mike. So you guys yeah. can have a reference point. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so next up money. So this is important because you don't want to be like the commissioner of a league and you know, it's like halfway through the season and someone drafted kill and Balaj and realize their, their team is total fucking shit. And you're trying to collect money at that point. It's just hard to do. So you really want to make sure you collect money up front. Uh, and the couple of the places where you can collect are team stake league safe. If you really trust the commissioner, uh, like, you know, like we trust Scott, for example, you know, you can do PayPal, you can do like, kind of, we kind of like trust Scott after yeah, yeah, some, yeah. some of the trades he's put out there. I don't know <laughs> yeah. if to trust anymore. Not after these trades, but, but the best place I would say for a beginning league, especially if you're doing it with strangers is to do league safe because you can just like vote on payouts and it's like majority rules. So like, they're not going to just like straight up steal your money. Uh, one tip I will say for league safe, a lot of people, if you sign up with your credit card, they charge you a 4% processing fee. To get around that, what you do is you deposit money on fanball.com, which is the parent company of LeagueSafe. Once you have your dollar balance in your account, you can use that to pay for LeagueSafe and completely avoid that 4% fee. So that's how you kind of fade that fee um, that people are scared of. But it's usually like pretty good, right? Because I mean, I don't know how comfortable you are handing your money to a stranger on Twitter, but I'm not that comfortable doing that. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't. I don't want to like sound cocky or anything, but if I were to do that, I would probably be the one doing it because... I, like this sounds like a dick te- type of thing to say but like i kind of have like a reputation right like if yeah. i run off with people's money they'll just like kill me on the internet and i'll just be like dead in the street <laughs> so this is definitely uh team stake and league safe are definitely good ways to go and mike said it pretty quickly but there's payout verifications and you can do either commissioner only or majority roles and you want to do majority roles because if you are in one of these discord leagues right and it's a bunch of random people obviously you want to have trust in everybody but you can't just trust random people all the time Uh, You want to do majority rules because if it's just the commissioner, they can go out and they can, you know, decide not to pay out the money for whatever reason, right? They want to run away with it. Um, If, if the commissioner does set it up to be uh, only commissioner to make the payout verify that a majority, you can actually email team stake or league safe and they'll go out and fix it. Or one of us can reach out if you uh, have a problem with that. So definitely try to do majority vote. And those those two different resources are really good ways to keep your money in a third party instead of handing it to a random person that you never met. Yep, for sure. I will say if you're in my leagues and I commissioner, I have full commissioner control just because like Noah said, uh, I don't want to lose my rep, but also like I have like very custom payments. So I don't want like, you know, league a majority approval every time I pay out like 10 bucks or something like that. Yep. <clears throat> and piggybacking off the payment, uh, a big thing about dynasty is you want people to stay around, right? You don't want them to draft like a shitty team and leave halfway through the year and all this different stuff. So uh, what we typically do is we require either one and a half or two times the annual buy-in amount. And what that does is not only helps you or incentivizes you to stick around, but it also pays for half of next year, right? This, this extra 50% of the buy-in isn't just going to the commissioner's pocket. So if it's like a $50 league, you pay 75, the extra 25 goes into next year. And then you pay 50 next year, the 25, the half of that 50 adds up to last year's 25 to make 50. And then it carries forward on and on. And this also incentivizes them to stick around because typically uh, we don't, if you were to drop out before like the league starts, whatever, you don't get the extra 25 back. You only get the $50 buy-in back. So if a new player comes in, they put in their 50 that year and every year thereafter. So it incentivizes people to stick around, which is obviously one of the biggest driving points in dynasty, because if people aren't sticking around, it's no longer a dynasty league. Yeah, your your average dynasty league, uh, and I say your average because the big dog leagues are going to be better than this because we're we're big dogs like that. But your average dynasty league lasts less than like lasts like one year to two years. Like very few dynasty leagues make it into the third year because like, you know, if you're a new dynasty joiner and your team sucks ass, like people don't want to stick around uh, to actually play it out. Uh, not everyone wants to be like adopt orphans like like me and Noah like taking over shitty teams and trying to turn it around. So, you know, that's like the big risk. And also what happens is like, if you have, usually the people that leave are the ones with really shitty teams because they suck. So what you're going to end up having to do sometimes is to discount the buy-in to incentivize a new owner to come in. So that's really where that 1.5 buy-in comes in because if that owner bails and at least you can offer a discount or some incentive for people to come in without hitting your pot. Yeah, Mike, I fathered a team this past year. Uh, Derek Carr <laughs> and Philip Rivers are my starting quarterback. So uh, that's probably what you're going to be walking into a lot of the time. That isn't to say you can't recoup it, right? You can trade those type of guys for like second or third round picks and rebuild. This isn't a strategy episode, but it's just saying don't always be afraid to orphan a team if yeah. it looks bad because you can play the long game. And sometimes I know, Mike, you find that very fun to you know build through the drafts yep. and be able to acquire young assets for aging veterans, uh, especially yep. if the team is depleted of any type of weapons. 
Yep. And, and one other thing, um, you know, probably for beginners, you don't want to do this. Um, but if you guys are looking for a little bit of a twist, uh, one way that I've seen people keep people in dynasty is to employ an empire pot. And what that means is like part of the pot every year goes to like a, a pot that accumulates over time. And there's some set of sort of rules that, cut set, that are set in place to help you win. So for example, in most leagues will be like whoever wins the league back to back gets that empire pot. Whoever wins the league back to back to back gets that empire pot. Personally, I think winning three times back to back is like damn near impossible unless your league mates are all trash. MJ um, did it twice, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm almost doing that in the BDG first league. So everyone else in there sucks. I'm just kidding. Uh, but what, what you can do and what I do is like the first person to win three uh, three years, not cumulative, just three years total, gets the Empire Pot. So what that that kind of gets people engaged and committed and it brings on a lot of strategies, right? So like you can either invest it heavy early or you can like invest long-term. And then after that, you can either roll the league up, do a startup or just start again with the Empire Pot. So that's another way to combat it if you're, uh, if you're looking for a more advanced setup. Yeah, I think that's the dynasty version of uh, what's it called, World Cup, where you have yeah. like an extra like 10% buy-in every year and then the fourth year, the winner gets all of it. But yeah, yeah. it's definitely a good way to incentivize sticking around. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so next up, we're going to talk about scoring a little bit. And then, you know, everyone loves their different things and I'll give my take and no can give his. Um, we'll tell you what we do for the Big Dogs uh, Dynasty standard. Um, but first up, Superflex, right? You know, we've talked has about Superflex. Has to be nauseum. Super flex. You have to do Superflex just like off fun alone. Trust me when I say this, like I have two one quarterback leagues that I'm in. And it's because the first Dynasty leagues I've ever joined was one QB. And immediately, like one year after, I like basically regretted it but i don't want to leave because i don't want to bail on the dynasty league so i'm just still in them but like you want to join Superflex because of the diversity and variability of your drafting strategy right like we talked about this a lot if you're doing a one qb uh league the draft is going to be just like playing vanilla just like straight up boredom you might as well put on auto draft set up bdg rankings just leave the draft yeah you mike know. you actually wrote that up in the draft guide the bg bible cop it the link <laughs> yeah. thing is up here somewhere big yeah. dogs draft guide.com slash mkf and he went through uh really in depth why it's important to play super flex i personally never even played in the one quarterback down oh really <laughs> yeah dude when people ask me these questions i'm like i don't know what you should trade for kyler murray like i only <laughs> quarterbacks i would give up a ton but it's probably not the right answer so yeah definitely super flex it makes things so interesting in the startup draft because you see so many runs and i'd imagine in one quarterback leagues there aren't any type of runs for quarterbacks like maybe second or third round somebody will reach on a lamar or pat mahomes but like yeah in super flex leagues rounds four through six i'd say um i know sleeper i think is red for quarterback it looks like somebody just like got murdered on the board because he <laughs> like red splatters all over the place because people want like uh Derek carr in like the seventh round it's just making egregious picks but uh, that definitely makes it very interesting as well as tight end premium but i will say um if this video is catering more towards like beginners um tight end premium may not always be ideal because it brings a whole nother element into it maybe if superflex is new to you ease into tight end premium don't bring it in right away and maybe if you join another startup um join with a tight end premium type of uh, scoring setting but i would say superflex is definitely enough in my opinion to spice things up yeah yeah i mean people say that you should start with one qb like fuck that throw that out of the window i think you should start superflex because superflex is the future and nobody's going back to one qb like trying to play one qb now would be like the equivalent of trying to start standard leagues back when ppr was coming up like that's not where you want to be and everything we do for big dogs is mostly tailored towards superflex we have a great community you have questions you can ask me ask me ask noah and we'll explain stuff to you so don't be afraid to get in and look you might join your first league and super flex and you're confused and you suck and you build like a shitty dynasty team right but that's a good learning experience because like, you got to start somewhere like my first super flex team uh i actually finished second but I, that's because i was lucky like my second super <laughs> flex team was super trash and it was a great learning experience so don't be afraid to dip your toes in there and just ask questions um and then the last part of this is like half or full ppr well, what, what are your thoughts on this no it's really up to you i personally prefer half ppr because i honestly don't know why i just think it's more equal right guys like james white aren't like rb1s on the end of mm -hmm. the year and terry cohen aren't really that good in real life but they're really good for fantasy yeah. I, don't know, I just like going half PPR. And then if you do do a tight end premium, it bumps up to one PPR. It's just easy round numbers. But whatever you like, whatever you prefer, the the Discord channel has both. Uh, you guys can vote on that. But, you know, personally, I'll go half. I honestly don't matter. As long as you know the rules when you're heading into it, everybody's drafting under the same assumptions, right? Guys like Robert yeah. Woods and Thielen might bump up a few rounds, but everybody knows that going into the league. I think at this point, um, I guess if you're a beginner, you might not know as much, but I think you can assume that guys who catch a lot of passes and maybe not a lot of touchdowns, you should value a little bit higher in full PPR than half. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I like, if you don't have any other settings other than this, I like half PPR. Uh, a lot of my leagues, what I do is I'll do full PPR and like, and like uh, some points per carry. And that kind of helps balance out the running back wide receiver dilemma. But if you're just starting, I would say super flex, uh, even tight end premium is fine too, but super flex at least and half PPR is probably just a great vanilla way to start off your leagues. And that's how I would do it. Um, next up topic, uh, before we talk about roster size, I want to talk about league size. So you hear a lot about eight, eight team leagues, 10 team leagues, 12 team leagues, 14 team leagues. Like what should you start with? I would say the most vanilla one is 12 team leagues. Um, 10 team leagues are just too shallow. Like there's not much skill involved. Like every team is freaking stacked all the time. Eight team leagues are just dumb. So don't even try them. But 12 team leagues, like a nice balance where you do have to like think about depth and you do have to like find that wide receiver three, four flex. Um, yeah, and at that point, three, you can't have three, not everybody can have three quarterbacks on the same roster, right? If it's a 10 yeah. team or eight team, 18 leagues, you can have four starting quarterbacks, right? 32 divided by yeah. Eight, uh, 10 or 32 divided by 10 everybody can have like at least three so 12 is a good balance because teams with only two quarterbacks are going to be looking for some when one gets injured yep. or when there's a bye week rolling around or if both their quarterbacks have a bye there's gonna be a lot more trades it's a lot more interesting uh, I definitely I've only done 12 team leagues and I think it's a good balance of you know trying to find roster depth and building a really good roster around uh, what you have yeah, yeah, I would I would recommend that as well. Starting with twelve team, I'm in a couple fourteen team leagues, and it kind of adds a totally new dynamic because, as you can see, there's only like you can there's only thirty two starting quarterbacks. So if each team rosters two, that's already at twenty eight. So it definitely changes the dynamic. So I would recommend starting at twelve, and then as you kind of develop and get more experience and want to add a new element to the game, explore some fourteen team leagues because they are they are definitely pretty fun. Um, the next part is league settings in terms of the roster size. So uh, you know, typically speaking. Uh, don't join leagues that are super shallow with roster size, mainly because it's just not as fun because everyone's just building like a stacked roster. When you increase the depth of the starting roster from like eight players to nine or even 10, which is probably my favorite, um, you're really going to have to start hitting on some of those like late round, uh, later round gems where like you can't just like start three studs and expect to win. It's all about building depth and building like a balanced roster. And it'll really flow in well with, uh, with the Bible and the draft guide and like basically the draft strategy that both Noah and I really follow in terms of trading back and acquiring depth. Yeah. If you start in a league where it's like six or seven players, you can just trade up like seventh and eighth round package that for like a fifth round and get all your starting roster done by like the fifth and you'll be stacked and there's your bench even though you don't have great players, like your stars are so good, it doesn't really matter. You obviously want depth, but uh, I personally like to do like anywhere from like eight to 10. So like one quarterback, two running backs, two to three receivers, two to three flexes, and then a super flex on top. Uh, I can't do that mental math in my head, but I think that adds up to either eight through 10, depending on how many receivers or flexes. Uh, as Mike said, it, it provides a really good blend. You're going to have to start guys like Tariq Cohen or James White, like I mentioned before, in some of these leagues. And although that isn't ideal, um, you know, you can you can focus on building depth and you don't always need the most stacked roster to win it all. I lost to a guy this past year who was like starting Todd Gurley, Raheem Mostert, like David Montgomery, guys that other than Todd Gurley, you weren't expecting much out of the out of um, this past year. But when you start to build for depth and you start to take those later shots because, you know, those guys are going to end up starting for you, it gets a lot more interesting. And you can find guys like last year, Cortland Sutton was probably going like the ninth or 10th round. So he's not actually starting for your team, but he can end up exploding and making on your starting roster. Yeah, for sure. Before we move on, actually, I just want to clarify what Superflex means. I know we didn't actually say it, but basically Superflex is a regular flex spot where normally you can start a running back, wide receiver, or tight end, except you can also start a quarterback. And the reason why that's important is because more often than not, you're going to want to start a quarterback because even the bad quarterbacks in that like QB 15 to 20 range is going to score much better and much more consistent than like your wide receiver three or RB three. So that's like the logic behind it. Um, but yeah, I just want to cover that real quick before we move on. Oh, um, I also want to say, um, don't do kickers and defenses. I guess if you oh, want yeah. to, you can, but like, I, I just don't see any type of point in it. Like there's like three kickers that keep their job year to year and defenses are so yeah. volatile anyways. It's like, I'd rather just not waste a roster spot or a pick on those. Yeah, there, there's no reason to have kickers or defenses in Dynasty. In, in redraft, I get it because there's an element of skill to it. But in, in like Dynasty, if you look at the defensive performance year over year, it's totally volatile and dependent on like matchups and stuff. So there's like enough to think about in Dynasty not have to worry about that. If you want to play defense, go play IDP. Uh, I don't play any IDP, so I can't help you on that. But don't have defenses or kickers in your leagues for Dynasty. Yeah, I also want to say, Mike, for league settings and the roster size, uh, how many bench spots do you typically play within your league? Because a, a lot of people ask, like, should I have 10 bench spots? Should I have 20? Should I have 30? Yeah. 
Uh, I think personally, I think we do like nine starters, 21 bench, and then taxi, which we'll get into later. I think that gives you a good blend. Like the startup drafts around 30 rounds, which is super deep. And a lot of those picks end up not mattering, but it makes things interesting, at least in the end. Yeah, I usually go for like 1.5 X, whatever the starting roster is. So if I have 10 players on the starting roster, I'm looking at a roster size of 25. So 15 players on the bench. Uh, Mm -hmm. because you do need that depth Uh, so that's kind of the ratio i try to go for and then you add taxi on top of that but and at the end of the day you're looking at somewhere between 28 to 30 total players uh including taxi yeah and at that point fab kind of gets like iffy like it doesn't matter too too much because not many guys are going to break out that are on the waiver wire so you don't want like 40 people on your team right and you're picking up like the fourth string quarterback on the rams for a hundred dollar bid but uh it gives (laughs) you a nice blend you can just end up throwing your fab into a trade anyways for people that think it does matter but uh, you'll yeah. find that waiver wires are extremely thin, especially in super flex leagues. Like every handcuff quarterback is owned by everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we'll, we'll get into a little bit of waivers after this. Um, but the next thing is like taxi squads, right? So what is a taxi squad? A taxi squad is basically a player, a group of usually call it three to five players that are rookies uh, or sophomores. If you put them into the taxi squad at your rookie year who don't contribute to your teams, you cannot put them in your starting lineup. But what it does allow you to do is it allows you to hold these young players as they develop. And the reason why it was created is because typically speaking, uh, rookies, especially wide receivers, take, you know, two to three years to really develop and become a contributor to your to your roster. So if you're someone that wants to invest in rookies, you know, you get that benefit of having them not count towards your total uh, to your active roster and instead sit on your taxi squad. So that's why I was developed. I think it was like Scott fish that probably came up with the idea. Um, but it's just like a cool way to add young players and, you know, a different dynamic to your roster. Yeah. In my leagues, at least you can only put on a player in your taxi squad during the rookie year and you can only put them on before the season starts. So if yeah. the season starts off and a player is super slow, like JJ Sega white side, and you had them on your roster, you can't then go and put them on your taxi squad. You have to treat it like a practice squad. You put them on there before the season, now, at least I think we're actually allowed to take them off. But once you take them off in season, you can't put them back on. Uh, yeah. I guess that varies league to league. But um, you can keep them on there for two years. After that second year is up, when it's heading into, I guess it would be like the third season, right? Uh, prior to that, you can either cut them, promote them to the active roster, whatever. You can't keep them on there forever until they break out. Like Corey Davis, you probably <laughs> want to keep them on there for as long as you can. But uh, that's just not how the taxi squad works. It's just a way for you, you know, your fourth round stashes. You want to roster them because you chose them for a reason but it, you don't want them to waste a roster spot on your bench, taking up one of those 20 to 25 uh, bench spots because you know, they're probably not going to do anything for you anyways. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. My recommendation is pretty similar to yours. You have to put it onto your, I have to put them onto your taxi squad before the season starts and they have to be rookies, but they can stay on for two years. So until they're sophomores and that's when you have to take them off. And that that's when usually, that's how I usually I run my leagues as well. And if you promote them in season, you can't put them back because you can't be like, Oh, well, let me see if this guy's good. Back. <laughs> I need oh, to flex this week. Yeah, exactly. roll at DJ Chark in his rookie year and get a zero. Yeah, exactly. That's not optimal for taxi squad, but uh, they are fun. So I do recommend you uh, putting them in the league because it does uh, offer a pretty different dynamic for your teams. Man, I got Demario Crockett on there. Oh, I can't wait to promote <laughs> him. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, all right. Next up, we're going to dive into the best part about Dynasty, about everything is probably the draft. And first up is draft order. Uh, so I've seen a lot of different ways to do this, um, but they're all, they're all going to be rooted in some form of random, right? Like however you want to do it. If you want to do a random draw, uh, if you want to do, there's a site where like you can assign players horses and there's an automatic horse that runs across the screen and whoever wins. Yeah. yeah so that's how I've done it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, what I, what I will say is you should, you can do something called a Kentucky Derby. So instead of getting randomly assigned a spot, you get, you get that, you get to choose first where you want to draft from. So if you come first in that random draw, you can choose to pick the one one or you can choose to pick the one eight. Everyone has preferences for where they want to pick. Um, but that's what a Kentucky Derby is. So instead of just randomly assigning orders, I think you can give people a chance. And everyone loves more drafts. So if essentially you're drafting a draft spot. So it's going to be more fun for you. Yeah, either way, it's going to be random. You can't base it on anything else. Sleeper allows you to just click a button and randomize it. Your heart stops for like the two seconds that the commissioner is pressing the button. And then you see like you're the 14th pick or like the 11th yeah. pick, however big your league is. And you're kind of like, damn, I can't get Christian McCaffrey. But uh, yeah, I actually really like that idea, Mike, the Kentucky Derby. Either way, it's going to be random and more drafts, the better. So yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a really yeah, good recommendation. Exactly. And this is, just to be clear, this is the startup draft. So we're talking about the startup draft where like all the pools are, all the players are available, including the veterans. Obviously, it's Dynasty. So after that draft, whoever you, whoever you draft, you get to keep on your team. And the following years, you're only drafting rookies. 
Um, but in terms of like draft settings, this is very different from redraft. Cause I'm sure if a lot of you guys come over from redraft doing like live drafts at home, like I do with, with some of my friends. Uh, but in dynasty, you want to have a slow draft. And what that means, like it's usually done like over, it's called email draft, but if you sleeper, there's no emails. You just do it in the app, but every pick, once you're on the clock, uh, you have about eight hours to make that pick. And it doesn't mean you sit there and wait eight hours to think about a pick. Uh, it, it's because you you spread it out over a few days and people have jobs and they have lives and, you know, but most importantly, it offers you the opportunity to negotiate trades because, you know, if you're playing dynasty, you're not trading, you might as well go back to redraft. There's literally no point. The best part of dynasty is being able to trade and in the draft, you can trade up and down. You can use your future rookie picks. Like there's just so many things you can do and you need time to negotiate, especially if you're like Scott and you're like finessing people all the time. You gotta be like, you gotta take he does it quick. Time. He doesn't need eight hours. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, you definitely want the eight hour clock. I know in our discord, there's people from like Ireland. I've picked up some lingo from there, but they obviously are in a different time zone, it's five or six hours ahead or behind. I, dude, I have no clue. Uh, and um, obviously you're on the West Coast and I'm on the East Coast. That's a three hour difference. Um, and obviously people work like third shift, second shift, they had different sleep schedules. So although it might sound or it looks like that they're wasting time, you have to realize that you have to accommodate for everybody else's type of lifestyle. Um, if you guys want to like ask where they're from prior to the draft to know that, then that'll probably make it more smooth sailing because then you won't think the guy's just being an asshole and just waiting on the clock for like seven hours and 55 minutes. But um, also on top of that, we typically pause overnight. We use like Eastern time from 10 to I think eight in the morning, 10 at night to eight in the morning. It just gives enough time that um, even if somebody's on the West Coast, right, they can still pick overnight, but they're technically not like on the clock. It doesn't waste up their time. So uh, it's just a way to be flexible. And that's why I think you should start your rookie drafts or your startup drafts. Um, much earlier than like mid-August, right? It'll probably take you like at least two to three weeks to fully fill out your roster, especially if you're doing a separate rookie draft after, which we'll talk about later. You want to definitely push that date back a little bit earlier. And it's not like redraft, right? Because if a guy like tears his ACL or gets injured in training camp, it's not like you lose them forever. It's a dynasty league. You keep them forever. You can end up trading them for maybe a smaller package than you would have hoped, but it's not as dependent on one year as a redraft league would. So typically we draft like, our rookie draft is right after the actual NFL draft. And if you're doing a startup, I have no problem doing it with right now because the information that comes out right now, most of the guys you're drafting early on aren't going to change unless you took like Antonio Brown early last year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then, so how do you deal with rookies? Right. So that, that's like one question and there's many ways to deal with this. I don't think there's any one way that's, you know, right or wrong. I have my preference. Um, but Basically, what you can do is you can do a startup draft with vets only and then do a separate rookie draft. And the order of that rookie draft is the inverse of the startup draft. So if you had the 1.01 in the startup, you would have the uh, 1.12 in the rookie. Uh, and the reason why people do that is because obviously if you start earlier in the main draft, you get better players. You should get uh, worse players in the rookie draft. Um, the, another way to do it is you can draft your rookies in the startup draft. So you can just have a combined pool of all the players. Uh, I would say this is probably the easiest way to do it if you're just starting out um, because, you know, you have all the players and everyone has a fair shot at everyone, right? So the problem with doing the inverse of the snake is because let's say, for example, in 2018, when you had Saquon Barkley uh, available in the rookie draft, if you picked from the 1.12, you got the 1.01 in the rookie, you secured Saquon Barkley, who would happen to be like a first round startup pick. So that was a huge advantage that you gain just from from random luck which you kind of want to avoid so that's why i avoid that strategy for the most part and then the last one is you can draft rookie picks so we talked about this before everyone loves more drafts the more drafts the better so what happens in this one is instead of drafting like let's say jonathan taylor in your draft what you do is you draft the rookie 1.01 and you have the right to that pick and you hold a rookie draft later on at a later date to then draft whatever rookie you want at that spot. And that creates a lot of variance, a lot of strategy. Uh, pretty fun because everyone values rookies differently. Yeah, a couple of things to touch on. For the supplemental draft where you do the reverse of the startup, typically rookie drafts are linear, right? So if you have the 101, you have the 201. But for these, you want to do snake because you don't want, you know, the 101 having uh, the rookie 112, then the 212, then the 312. That just further diminishes it. You want them to have the 112 and the 201 or else like you'll see the 112, right? Just for this year, they could realistically draft like, Dak Prescott, Tyreek Hill, the rookie draft, they get Jonathan Taylor. And then if they're back up at the 201, if you're going to do linear, they get like a, a T Higgins, a Denzel Mim, something like that. And then the 101 would get like Christian McCaffrey, Justin Jefferson, Josh Allen, and like DJ Moore, which is obviously a step down, even though you're getting Christian McCaffrey. Uh, and another thing, when you draft picks, right, there's no option to actually, or at least when I do it, I haven't seen it on sleeper. You can't actually draft a pick. What you'll do is you draft a kicker and you're allowed to put a, uh, 
was it nicknames, right? Um, yep. And for the nickname of the player, you put like 101. So if you chose the first kicker, that holds the place of the rookie 101. The fifth kicker is the 105. The 17th kicker is like the 205 or whatever. So after that, then the commissioner goes back and reassigns picks. They add a supplemental draft through the settings and they give you the picks based on the kickers you had. Then you can drop all your kickers and the lineup or the draft uh, order will be set for you. And then you can go on your way and drafting in the rookie draft. Yeah. And every, like I said, everyone loves more drafts. And trust me, when you do it that way, it's like super fun. Uh, and you get twice the number of drafts and you get twice the variance because everyone just values shit differently. And it's, it's a dope time. So I don't allows for a lot more trades too, because when that second draft yeah. rolls out, people are going to be like, well, I could have taken the 102, but <laughs> if I knew it was going to be Jonathan Taylor, then I would have paid a lot more. So uh, yeah. it definitely makes things more interesting. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, so how to deal with rookie drafts? Some people like to have uh, rookie drafts with only rookies. That's typically how I run my leagues. You could also run a rookie, supplemental rookie draft that includes free agent vets. Um, but if you're in a dynasty league that's relatively deep, like with the roster settings that we're recommending, it really doesn't add much value to have the free agent vets in there. So usually I leave the fab for free agent vets and I leave the rookie for the rookie drafts. Yeah, I do that as well because that just further devalues the fab, right? Like we had yeah. an, not an argument because we're not like being hostile about it, but Rob Gronkowski obviously came back this past year to play for the Buccaneers and he was on waivers and people are like, well, I want to draft him in the rookie draft. People were under the assumption that the rookie draft is only rookies, which it is. And those that wanted to draft Rob Gronkowski were kind of taking away from those that traded, you know, their rookies third and fourth because they didn't expect free ages to be in there. So that has to definitely be in the bylaws if you want to include vets. Obviously, you can do it and there's no problem with it if it's part of your rules. Yeah. I personally like only doing rookies because it is technically a rookie draft and that just further devalues the fab if guys like Gronkowski or Percy Harvin, if he plays again, are being drafted and then guys like Harrison Bryant are being pushed onto the waivers and you spend fab on them rather than a player that actually might impact you year one. Yeah, exactly. And then so the after your startup year and your year one's complete, you're on to year two, you're on to your first like itself rookie draft. And in terms of determining that order, uh, usually you do reverse standings for uh, you. Basically, basically, what you want to do is the weakest teams get the best picks. That's like the overarching concept that you should try and aim to get. And there's various ways to get there. And we'll talk about how to do that later and tanking and all that stuff. But the rookie draft, as Noah said, is linear, not snake. So what that means is you have 101, 201, 301, 401. The same person has all of them unless they trade them away. The reason is because like the rookie pool just isn't that good. So uh, you're trying to basically, you're trying to have like some sort of balance where like one team is not freaking dominating the entire time. time yeah, think of it as like the actual yeah. NFL draft, right? How they order it. The worst team gets the first pick or whatever. All the non-playoff teams get ordered in reverse order. And obviously if you're like the Cardinals or the Cincinnati Bengals, you're not going to have the 101. And then in the second round, have the 2.32. You're also going to have the 201. So it kind of mirrors what the NFL actually does. Yeah. And so what happens is for the top six teams, you're always going to determine it based on playoffs. Uh, so whoever wins gets the last pick, second place gets the second, uh, second last pick, et cetera, et cetera. For the bottom six teams that don't make the playoffs, that's kind of where you have like some options. So the easiest way to do it is just the reverse standings of like their win loss record. And that's probably what most people do. Um, what I would recommend you do and what I do in most of my leagues is I use uh, the potential points for, so kind of like a best ball format. And the reason why I do that is because like that's a more accurate representation of who the worst teams are because you're playing best ball for for their players whereas like if you leave it to win loss you kind of incentivize people to kind of bench their studs and like we already talked about this but that's like i think that's super weak but if the rules allow for it you should be doing it because you're trying to win right so it, by doing a potential points for system uh which is like the maximum that you're the best starting lineup you could have put up on any given week that kind of reflects like who the bad teams really are and who should be getting the picks. And the good news is it's not uh, manual. You don't have to calculate that yourself, uh, regardless of what platform you use, whether it's MFL uh, or sleeper, they have an option to show it. Um, you basically just go into standings and there's a double click somewhere where you can just show what the potential points for, and then you can assign picks that way. Yeah, that definitely de disincentivizes. Is that even a word? It doesn't allow for tanking, which, you know, the reverse of the startup, you can have guys like Joe Mix and Devontae Parker or whatever and just bench them every week and put in like a bunch of frauds and then get the 101 and get Trevor Lawrence or whatever. Yeah. Obviously, at that point, we'll touch on it more in tanking, but like anybody can do that. You can have a stud lineup and just tank for everybody, put everybody in your bench just to get the 101. As Mike said, it's weak. It just takes away from the fun of fantasy. So uh, I highly 
advise not doing that. And I think most leagues is like, if you guys get along, you kind of have like a code. You don't always have to yeah. write it down because it's super subjective most of the time, but it's like, just yeah. don't, don't sit Stefan Diggs for Chris Conley. Like just yeah. put, put out your best players. Yeah, exactly. And the, the, the reason why I do this is because like using potential points for is it just takes subjectivity out of it. Like I don't even want to freaking deal with that stuff. So it's like whatever I don't have to do. And if it's automated and I'm lazy, so if it's automated, I'm good for it. So that's kind of how I think about it. But, you know, everyone runs their league different. And if you're with people you trust, like run it how you see fit. That's just my recommendation. Um, and then timing, like when you hold your draft, right? I'm going to generate and uh, I, I'm in like 20 different leagues. So I do drafts before the NFL draft. I do drafts after the NFL draft. I think the best time uh, is to do it after the NFL draft. And the reason why is because you know where people have landed. There's no more guessing. There's no more like people drafting Hakeem Butler super high because they think he's really good and he goes to like the fourth round or Calvin Harmon or stuff like that. And there's just like too many like variables that you have to account for already in Dynasty. There's no point in trying to add more variables to it. I do it, like I said, because I'm a, basically a degenerate gambler and I love gambling. But if, you, if you're not and you're just like starting out and you're trying to learn, the best time to do it is after the NFL draft. Yeah, rookie draft, I would say almost always want to do it after. For startup draft, you can do it really whenever. The only thing I'll say is if you want to do it where you draft either the picks or the players, prior to the NFL draft, you obviously want to draft the picks instead of the players because you could end up picking somebody like a, a Tyler Johnson, right? You expect him to yeah. be obviously like a day two pick and he goes round five or whatever, so that really hurts it. Um, if it's after the NFL draft, you can either do draft the rookie picks if you want another draft or – um, it also allows for you to draft the actual players because you know the landing spots at that point. So it doesn't really harm your team. Uh, there's not as much risk as, as if you were to do it before. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and one thing I want to cover, probably unique to this year because of COVID, uh, fuck COVID. But basically there's some rumors that because of like COVID, there might not be a college football season or at least a full college football season. So, you know, we're probably going to see more players than normal enter the supplemental draft. And the worry there is like, Someone like Travis Etienne, who would probably be an easy top five pick, rookie pick next year, enters a supplemental, and you have a bunch of people like bidding on him with Fab. Uh, so some of the ideas thrown out there this year include, you know, doing a supplemental draft where you have like two rounds and everyone gets a pick that's like based on randomized order. Uh, you know, there's people throwing out like, you know, just delaying your entire NFL, your entire draft until after the after the uh, supplemental draft so you just like have a full view and everyone can select from everywhere now, honestly like there's no perfect solution here and hopefully it doesn't happen uh because if it happens we're kind of screwed but you know you kind of just have to think through uh this problem so we just raise it this time to think about but there really is no like perfect solution here i would say though in my opinion at least that using your 2020 picks and combining it with the supplemental draft probably isn't the best way because Obviously, in like February and March, we start to hear like, oh, Travis Etienne isn't coming out. Devonta Smith isn't coming out. Chuba Hubbard isn't coming out. So those who had like second round picks that thought maybe like Jalen Rager or Jerry Judy might fall to the second round start to trade those picks. But now that these guys end up coming back, those second round picks that they gave up, you know, they, they gain so much more value. And obviously, you can say, oh, that happens all the time where people don't declare. That's like a known commodity, right? We know every year that guys are going to defer until the next year. We don't know that guys are going to defer and then come back. So it's an unprecedented, unprecedented thing. Um, Mike, we were talking about it before, and I think you said that you were going to use like 2021 picks yeah. to bid on those picks if you want to touch on that more because I think that's yeah. a much more fair way to do yeah, it. Yeah, I, I think like what I'm, I've been thinking through this a lot, and what I'll recommend is I'll hold a supplemental draft, and then I'll have – people bid on those picks using their 2021 picks because they're the ones that are most impacted. So if a Travis Etienne enters this class, like someone probably traded for the 2021 pick, like expecting to have a shot at Travis Etienne. So they should be able to afford to, you know, give up that pick in order to land him. And in terms of like determining how to do that uh, pick order, um, it's a little bit tricky. You can use like basically the reverse standings of this year to kind of value those picks, or you can use some sort of like lottery system, or you can use like a randomly assigned order. I would recommend you check out uh, Curtis, uh, Curtis Patrick. He put out like a nice little like lottery system on Twitter uh, in terms of how to deal with that. But I think the best way to do it is to use 2021 picks because they're the ones that are most impacted. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the only thing I'll say is definitely not 2020 picks. And if you know, if you want to read Curtis Patrick's article or whatever he put up about it, uh, yeah, that's probably the best way to do it because it's the most equal way to actually do it. Because as you said, like people are trading for those 20 or 21 picks because we know the wide receiver class was loaded. And then now that those like top three running backs are probably gonna be like top six or seven guys in this class went and deferred. And now we're going to come out next year, we hope like, yeah, it's, there's a ton of value there. 
Yeah, for sure. And then next part is obviously, like we said, the most part of fun part of dynasty is trading, like trading picks, trading players, whatever you want to call it. But trading picks is a major portion of it. So, you know, it's always tricky. Like, how do you deal with it? Like how many years in advance can you trade? Um, typically in my leagues, I allow you to trade two years up in advance. But what happens is once you trade a future first or future second, you have to pay that league's dues because what you don't want is a bunch of guys trading their entire future, going all in on one year and then like winning and dipping or like losing and dipping. You know what I mean? Yeah. For ours, it's basically the same thing. You only pay up until the year you're paid in. Uh, and we typically just, we're uniform, right? We'll just pay in a year in advance with that extra 50% uh, rollover. So for this year, we'd only be able to trade or actually next year, uh, 21, 20, 22 picks up until the year you're paid in for at least half of that season. So as Mike said, right, if you're trading like 2023 20, and 2024 20, picks, we obviously don't know like all the prospects yet, unless you're like Mike or Ray and you're like <laughs> scouting these high school guys. But like, uh, yeah, and if somebody wants to orphan the team after somebody leaves and they see that they have absolutely no assets and just a bunch of aging veterans like Todd Gurley and Julio Jones, it's gonna be really hard to find um, people that want to orphan those teams, obviously. So I uh, yeah, definitely only trade the picks up until when you're paid in to incentivize not only staying around, but not completely blowing up your team and, you know, having that outlook that you want to give up after the year where you made all those moves. Because some people that are rebuilding would pay a premium for like 2022 picks while you want to win now, you give them up for nothing and then you're gone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And as starters, I would just recommend you only allow trading up to one year in advance. So for this year, you can only trade 2021 first and not 2022 or 2023. Because like, once you get that far out, like I said, first of all, your dynasty leagues don't make it that far for the most part anyways. Uh, so you don't want to like do that. Um, but second of all, it's just like, how do you even begin to value those picks? Like you, you just don't. So do one year up in advance and then make sure they're paid in. Definitely. Uh, so trade deadline. So this is an interesting one. Uh, there's a lot of takes out there in redraft. You know, typically you have a trade deadline uh, because like once a team is eliminated, they have nothing else to play for. Right. So you don't want someone just like punting players, dropping players uh, just to just like fuck with you uh, in dynasty. You're kind of building for however long you want. Right. So um, I, I don't know, like what, what are your thoughts on this? Do you typically like uh, having a trade deadline or no trade deadline? Yeah, in the NFL, they obviously have a trade deadline and most of Dynasty mirrors it, but I have no problem with not having any trade deadline because those people that are in the playoffs or in the Super Bowl or the championship or whatever, and they want to trade a ton of assets to win now, they're probably giving up a ton of future assets to win that year. And you obviously want to win every single year, but when you realize people are trading like three firsts in a player for DeAndre Hopkins just to win that one week who might not even win them that one week, uh, it screws them over. So it's not only... I don't think it's as bad as many people think to have like an indefinite trade deadline just like all year round because it's really risky to give up a ton of future assets just for one or two weeks of production. So I think a lot of people are incentivized to not trade because of the volatility in that. Um, but it also helps the lower end teams that might not be playing anymore. I know like the bottom six teams that don't make the playoffs, they still want to be active in the dynasty league. They don't want to like leave for two months and come back, see who won and then get ready for the rookie draft. They want to still trade. So it also allows them to move, you know, future assets or whatever, uh, even though they're not active currently uh, to build for the future and still be involved in the dynasty league. Because the whole thing about dynasty is you want engagement, right? You want to be talking to people. You want to be uh, making friends and making, you know, connections and making trades or whatever. And if you, at least for me, in my opinion, if you take away or if you add a trade deadline, it kind of just, it dulls things out after like November, right? And the season has like four months, a four month span of you not really doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know like some people uh, don't like it because what happens is like once you get in the playoffs, you get like an arms race between like the playoff teams, like to see who can accumulate stuff. And, you know, that's like definitely it's like it's like up to the team right like if they want to punt their future and you know try and risk it all for two weeks like you should let them do that but if you're just beginning and you're not comfortable with that concept i would stick to like a week 13 trade deadline right so basically when the playoffs start um that's when trading stops uh, or a happy medium and one that i've seen implemented with pretty good success is playoff teams can only trade with playoff teams and non-playoff teams can only trade with non-playoff teams. So if you're limited in playoffs, trade whatever it is you want, because it's like off season for you already. You're trying to think about next year and all that stuff. Um, and then that kind of helps solve the arms race problem. So those are a couple of options um, that, that you can kind of play around with and see what you guys like. And one yeah. of the most touchy subjects in all of fantasy football dynasty or not vetoing trades. 
Mike, I know you're a proponent of never hitting that veto button, but are there any cases where you will actually veto a trade or let somebody redo a trade if they like messed up or whatever? Uh, yeah, so but no vetoes like ever. Uh, but what I do have, well, definitely no like voting vetoes. Like those are the worst leagues where, you know, you do a trade and then like you vote as a, as like a subconscious, like as a full group to see like if the trade should have gone through or not, because everyone is going to just vote in their own interest. And if you did a trade that's good and they didn't get it, they're not going to want it to pass. So that is a bar, zero, like no tolerance. Like don't ever have that. If, the, if your league has that, just leave. Trust me. You're, you're yeah. Gonna I have an example for that, Mike. And you know it very well. The famous Baker Mayfield for Kyler Murray trade. <laughs> yeah. Last year I moved Baker Mayfield for Kyler. And I think like our second, third and fourth. And yeah. at the time, right, we hadn't known what Kyler Murray was. Baker Mayfield is yeah. obviously coming off of an incredible rookie year. At the time, people might have won a veto because they're like, oh, this guy's getting this really short quarterback that can't see over his offensive line and a bunch of random picks. Like, how is yeah. that fair? But people value things differently. I value the youth and the mobility that Kyler Murray had over what Baker Mayfield brought to the table. And that ended up working out really well for me. Or if you traded like Andrew Luck last year for a bag of chips because you heard all those rumors, you might not think it's fair. And then the guy retires. Dynasty is so much different than redraft because there's so many factors that come into play, whether it be age, contract, situation. Redraft, you know, you have to worry about uh, 16 weeks, right? There's, you don't have to worry about contracts, uh, age, unless you're like Todd Gurley, who the second half of the year is just done. But um, yeah, I definitely would not veto trades. The only exception is, Sometimes people do make mistakes and they click something by accident. It happens in the star draft a lot on sleeper uh, on mobile. If you click to like read about a player and you miss click and click draft, there's no, are you sure you want to draft this player? It just yeah. puts them on your team. And if somebody responds right away, like, Oh shoot, I didn't mean to do that. I'll allow a reverse because there's obviously a mistake that's been made. Or if there's a yeah. trade and somebody's like, Oh, I didn't know it was this pick or this pick. I won't automatically redo that. The two parties have to agree on uh, reversing the trade because um, some people might say, oh, they should have read the trade more in depth, which is also a big topic. You want to make sure you know what picks you're getting. You don't want to trade a startup first for like a rookie <laughs> first and like a rookie fourth, right? There's yeah. no value in that unless Saquon Barkley's in the yeah. rookie draft, like Mike said. But yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely I would not veto a trade unless the two parties agree and reciprocate on reversing it. Yeah, one one exception I do have is I do have like in at least the leagues that I commission, um, I have like veto to commissioner rights only. And the reason why I do that is because like f to uh, avoid collusion and what collusion is, is literally two teams transpiring to the benefit of one team at the detriment of the other. And the reason why it's very hard to enact is because it's very hard to prove, right? Like just because you, the general consensus values a player of one way and everyone else values a player another way doesn't mean they're right. So you can't just like veto. Like for example, at the beginning of last year, if you traded Juju Smith-Schuster for DJ Moore, someone would be like, that's an awful trade. But you know, one year later, look where we are, right? The collusion comes in, like when you see collusion, it's pretty damn obvious. It'd be something like I trade DeAndre Hopkins for like uh Hakeem Butler, Hakeem Butler yeah. or like or like a bench player right that's a very obvious case of collusion in that case what ends up happening is I'll just like boot that guy straight out of my league uh <laughs> because I don't want to deal with them and I have that clause written in my bylaws so I have that power to do so um but that's the only time you veto something is when it's like so obvious it's collusion where you're giving up an obvious lesser asset for an obvious more asset and like the only time you can see that is like when you're tr literally trading bench players for starters but that's the only time I uh, veto and it's commissioner veto yeah, and it's sometimes like super subjective, but you can just like ask the guy, like rationalize why you made the trade. Like obviously that's a super extreme one, like you said, but we actually had an issue in one of the Discord channels or one of the Discord leagues where somebody legitimately traded the rookie 101 for the rookie 102. And yeah, got nothing else in return. Like obviously we make those jokes like, oh, it's it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, literally, I literally tweeted that joke. Yeah. Would the Bengals trade back to the 102 this year <laughs> because they knew the Redskins weren't going to take Joe Burrow and get nothing else? Like not that it's collusion because – whatever like some people have their own reasons like oh, i'm gonna get whoever i want anyways but like you have to be getting something in return for moving back in the draft like there's no yeah. point moving back and uh as mike said like in that case i probably wouldn't boot the guy because he's not trying to like fully collude i guess but like sometimes you got to do better than that yeah <laughs> like, but that but that's like it that's like an easy one to like just basically veto because it's like look yeah. you're literally giving up a objectively zero subjectivity involved you're giving up an objectively better pick for a worse pick like someone made me this offer in a startup uh and i think i was sitting there in the 11th round and i was like hey i'm looking to trade back and someone just offered me their 16th round pick straight up and I was like, dude, like, sorry, I don't know if this is like a mistake or something, but uh, I, I'm going to have to pass on this. He's like, oh, no, like, I just, I saw that you didn't have a 16th round pick, so I figured you might want mine. And that was like his actual <laughs> rationale. So, yeah, so if, so if I saw that go through in a trade, I'd be like, okay, that's fucking collusion. Like, 
but you know, you'd probably reverse that trade. But uh, again, it has to be very, very obvious. It can't just be like bad trades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of people make a lot of bad trades and sometimes they benefit off of those. So you can't, you can't determine how other people value players, right? Even if your trade calculator is telling you that the other person won by a big margin. Yeah. Um, next part is waivers. So waivers is very different from redraft In redraft. It's like exciting. You know, you're like streaming tight ends, you're streaming quarterbacks. Like every week you're putting in your waivers and when the handcuff becomes available, like you're blowing your entire fab budget to try and get it. That's not how it works in dynasty. Like we said, it's like 30 man deep rosters. So you are like, you're very rarely getting a potential starter uh, like ever. Like I nailed on Philip Lindsay. That was like my best waiver wire hit of all time. And he had like that one really good season, but you're not getting like, you're not getting guys like Aaron Jones and stuff off the waivers very often because more often than not, people are drafting like second backups, like third round, third backups of like running backs and like quarterbacks and all that stuff. So, uh, but what you do have is you still have some fab and there, you still got to spend it. Right. Cause you might get that third round, that player you flip for like a third round pick, right. And that third round pick you can use in the next round. But what happens is you have to use fab. Uh, so I think even if you're coming from redraft, if you're a big dog follower, you know, you're using fab, what that means is the free agent acquisition budget. And it's a rolling waiver the entire time. So you can't just go and pick up a free agent like instantly because people have jobs, people have lives. You don't want to be like, you don't want to reward people for just sitting on their phone on Twitter for like 24 seven and then like picking up a player because they heard the news first. Right. You want to have a rolling waiver and everyone submits their bids. Um, how do you, how do you, what do you think about that? Yeah. Mike talking about sitting on Twitter and seeing news, uh, quick, quick story. Two years ago, I think it was, I had Nick Chubb on my team as a redraft league. And I saw the news that I think it was Marshawn Lynch got put on IR. So I dropped Nick Chubb for <laughs> uh, Doug Martin and literally five minutes later, I get a Schefter notification that they traded Carlos Hyde. And he was like the RB <laughs> for the rest of the season. So sometimes it doesn't always reward you. Yeah. Um, yeah, on the other hand, you're definitely not looking to pick up anybody off of waivers to start in your team. The only thing that's going to be streaming in Dynasty Leagues are tears down your face when you see like Damian Willis <laughs> is the top guy. I legit spent 100 bucks on free agent <laughs> acquisition budget on Damian Willis last year after the fourth week of preseason because they were saying he was going to be out there in two wide sets. <laughs> did not happen at all, but he's still on my team somehow. So yeah, there's definitely going to be super, super uh, thin waiver wires out there. Guys like PJ Walker, I guess, from like the XFL, you can go out and spend your money on that. But um, what I will say for new people is if you actually believe in somebody on waivers, it's going to be very rare. It's in a rare occurrence. I would literally just blow all my fab on it because the chances that somebody else shows up is extremely slim. And also the difference, I'm not sure if you said it, Mike, so apologies if I repeat what you said. Um, there's also two fabs, right? You have one for the entire off season and you have one for in season. So it, it resets. If you have a hundred dollars from, you know, February until the beginning of September, you have $100. And then once the season starts, there's no rollover. You just get a fresh slate of $100 for in-season acquisition. So yep. uh, that's how Dynasty Leagues run. Yeah, that's that. That's like the best way to do it. And, you know, I think having the off-season and in-season is exciting because, like, you know, chances are you're not going to hit on anyone. But, you know, you kind of get to fire two shots uh, based on, like, trying to make guesses before preseason and depth charts of that. And then in-season when you have, like, real depth charts, it's uh, it's, like, pretty exciting. Uh, definitely not as exciting as redraft so you know don't expect to like pick off like weekly starters off the waiver wire but when you see like uh, i'd say like oh last year like when when i saw gardner Minshew was on waivers after drafts um in any leagues that i didn't already draft him i just picked him up because he's like a backup quarterback right and nick Foles is not that good so it's like stuff like that where you're like basically making bets like long 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 in advance yep i think we're on to the last one tanking this yep. is your favorite subject and you know it a lot more in depth than I do in terms of that setting that sleeper and MFL have. So why don't you touch on that in terms of like how to avoid it and just be objective about it? Yeah. Tanking, tanking has a bad connotation because um, I mean, you're literally like trying to lose and that goes against like everything and every fiber of like people's bodies. Like you want to win. I mean, unless you're a loser, don't play fantasy, I guess. Um, unless you're Scotty Pippen with a migraine. Yeah. But there's like, there's like legit ways to tank and there's like not legit ways to tank. A legit way to tank is you realize, look, I fucked up. My roster sucks. I'm not going to win. I will sell off my veterans off my roster to get future draft picks. And that takes points off your team and stores it into the draft picks, which you can then use for younger players. A not legit way to tank is to sit there and be like, oh, I'm not going to make playoffs and let me sit Julio Jones, Saquon Barkley, uh, and CMC. Although if you have CMC, you didn't make playoffs, you should probably retire from Dynasty anyways. It's probably suck. <laughs> but uh, you know what I mean? Like, don't like just obviously sit players. And like, it's really hard to police it because again, it's very subjective. Like, who am I to tell you that maybe you think that, you know, uh, who's like a no name receiver? Maybe you think that like uh, 
B so B B B Johnson or whatever that <laughs> B C Johnson yeah yeah if maybe Jack you think B. That, B. you kind of combine yeah. like both the slot receivers with the <laughs> yeah. maybe you think that B C Johnson has a great slot matchup that week and they're better than Julio Jones and you should start them I can't tell you no right but what what really like pisses me off is when people just like don't even feel like starting rosters and they're putting it like third fourth string running backs in place of like starting running backs just to like tank and that's like to me like if you do that you're like weak as fuck and like i don't want you in my leagues anyways but if you are doing that like the way to protect against it is to use the potential points for as a commissioner because like if they already do it and you try and go back and reverse it you're going to cause like a storm people are just gonna get pissed off so what you do is you go into sleep and you you go to sleeper and you use the potential points for system and what potential points for is it's like best ball. So after the week is done, it tells you what your best lineup would have been. And that calculates your season score. And it does that on a week by week basis. And at the end of the year, you're going to have the bottom six teams and you can rank them in inverse order of that. And that'll help you uh, really battle, really battle against like the anti-tanking, the, the non-legit tanking, because like tanking is part of the strategy but when you do it via like manipulating lineups, like you're just like weak sauce. Yeah, and even if you do it the way that Mike is saying, right, there's a legitimate way to tank. And, like, we have one guy in our league, actually in two leagues, and he has, like, basically the same strategy. He just punted year one. He's legitimately fielding Chip Kelly – or not Chip Kelly, uh, <laughs> Chad Kelly as his starting quarterback. When you look at his bench, he has nobody else, and he just has a bunch of bums. But you look at his 2021 picks, and he has, like, five firsts, like, six seconds. Like, that's the legit way to tank. If you want to actually tank, I'm not saying go out and sell every asset. You obviously want to rebuild it around some young guys like TJ Chark. Obviously, but Christian McCaffrey – probably trade him for a lot of future assets but if you have a few guys that you feel like aren't getting good packages in return for just build around them and just starting like a dj chark or like a stefan diggs or an amari cooper isn't going to win you that many weeks even on a potential points for basis so um th there's a correct way to tank and there's kind of like a dickhead way to tank where you just like sit actually good players for a bunch of frauds which as mike said it's really subjective so you can't really police it too much but i think you know, people that are paying actual money, if you're paying like 50 bucks to sit actual good players when you have a legit chance to win or compete or make your money back at the very least, then I don't really know what you're doing playing Dynasty. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the part of that is like, the reason why it's not because I don't give a fuck if you burn your own money, like go for it. But what happens is like in those like final weeks, that's when you're determining like playoff order, right? So when you're impacting like someone else's chance, like make playoffs because you tanked and gave a free win to someone, like that's like fucked up, right? Cause, so that's why... That's why I don't like having like non-legit tanking um, is to protect like the other people in the league. If you want to punt your money, like I do sometimes, punt away, but like don't impact yeah. other people. If you want to punt your money, send it this way. I'm very, like, <laughs> I'm very appreciative of that. Yeah. Um, so I think that those are all the things that we wanted to knock off uh, on starting on startup strategy. Um, yeah. if, if you guys have, have any more questions, we have a BBB for bunk bed breakdown or big baller brand, but we don't associate with them. Uh, BBB Q and A, and you guys can put more questions that we didn't cover and, or in the comments, we'll try to respond to as many as we can uh, for other topics. This isn't really a strategy video. This is more like how to start, uh, join or uh, police a league or run a league or commission a league, whatever. So if you have any more questions that we didn't really touch on, um, that's like a beginner type of question, we'll, we'd be glad to answer that because this is meant to be like an evergreen video, like we said in the beginning, that can help year in and year out for helping start and you know commission a dynasty league. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then uh, before we go, I guess we'll touch on this week's segment of the narrative. Good to be back. Hit that intro. All right, so we took a break from the narrative for a little bit because there was literally nothing to talk about on Twitter. Uh, people were just recycling stuff, so there were no narratives. Um, but one thing that I've been seeing recently this week uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of well-respected and like, you know, probably better than me, like dynasty players uh, have come on Twitter and said, look, the best way to win dynasty is to use your rookie picks and trade them away to get veterans. Uh, you should trade away all your rookie picks and like buy veterans a discount. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that is the best way to win dynasty? It's definitely not in a vacuum. You should always do that. Right. Obviously, yeah. like you said that you're with Saquon Barkley, if you traded the one one for Todd Gurley at that time. It sounds fantastic, but now you have Todd, you have Todd Gurley <laughs> in Atlanta with one knee running for 850 <laughs> yards a season. And you have Saquon Barkley with quads the size of this entire room that I'm in, just housing the, the Washington Redskins every other week. Obviously, if you're in like the third and fourth round, I don't disagree with that. Like Snacks was asking me, oh, should I trade my 309 for Marvin Jones? I would say <laughs> yes, because Marvin Jones doesn't make your starting roster. And Tyler Johnson, for as much as we love him, is probably going to be on your taxi squad for at least for two years and you're gonna have to decide to cut him or promote him it really depends on 
your your setup, right? If you want to trade your like 109 for Julio Jones because you're in win now, I'm not saying in every case you should do that, right? Because sometimes you'll want a Jalen Rager or a CeeDee Lamb over him. It's a case-by-case basis. So making it a general uh, generalization that you should always trade your rookie picks for a veteran because X player has never played in the NFL before is kind of a lame argument because nobody's played in the NFL before they played in the NFL. Like who yeah. played in the NFL before when he was in Alabama? Neither did Amari Cooper, Josh Jacobs. Miles Sanders was in Penn State before he joined the Eagles behind that offensive line and tore everybody's face off. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure you'll have somewhat of a similar take to me, Mike, that I don't think it's definitely something you should, you should generalize to all rosters. And it's not a good, a good seed to plant in everybody's head, especially when they're new to Dynasty. They don't know how to value rookie picks. Yeah, exactly. I, th- I think like all things, right, it's about finding a balance, right? You don't want rookie fever where you're like giving up like Nick Chubb for like the 110 or something like that. But at the same time, I think like building a dynasty requires you to like refresh and use like rookie. So I'm always comfortable trading down on like a lot of stud wide receivers or stud running backs to get like a younger piece plus a rookie pick. And like, like you, like, like you said, like, I don't really understand the argument of like, oh, but like they haven't played it down in the NFL. Look, I get it. They haven't played up down in the NFL, but in the in your veterans, like even with your amongst your veterans, like people in the first round and second round bust all the time, right? So people always quote the first round hit rate of only fifty percent. That's true. If you're if you have if you think you have a random skill and like random luck and you know you're just like a random guy just plugging in and you know picking a random stuff, there's a lot of things you can do to really reduce. Uh, really help you fade the bus and that's why like we talk about don't spend so much time on those like third round fourth round darts what you want to do is like focus your time on how to fade how to fade like bus at the top of the draft and that you can do a lot of stuff to help you increase the odds of hitting on rookies especially this year when you have so much talent at the running back position Uh, that's one of the easier places to hit what i do like to do though is to trade rookie uh, rookie wide receivers and rookie picks in the later rounds for like veteran wide receivers if I need that production. So it's about like finding a balance. Don't be the guy that has like rookie picks like one 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 point one to one point ten and use all of them on rookies. Like don't be that guy. But also don't be the guy that has rookie picks from one to one ten and trades all of them and doesn't have any rookies. You gotta like find some balance in the middle. And more often than not, I find like rookies can be a lot safer than people think. Yeah, and you always bring up the point of people appreciating value from year one to year two. If you're on the clock at like 201 and somebody's offering you a Calvin Ridley for that pick and that pick turns into T. Higgins, right? T. Higgins this year for at least right now is probably going to be sitting behind AJ Green if he plays this year. What are the chances that T. Higgins' value from year one to year two improves? It's a lot less than Calvin Ridley's value improving because we know who he is. He's a known commodity. Julio Jones is obviously going to be a year older next year. Calvin Ridley is probably going to have another good season if he stays healthy. And then you could easily trade Calvin Ridley for T. Higgins plus. So I like yeah. to think of it that way, definitely. Um, guys like C.D. Lamb are a little bit different. I know Nikhil Harry busted last year, but when you think of a lot of the other rookie guys that went early, like D.K. Metcalf, Debo Samuel, A.J. Brown, uh, yep. Terry McLaurin is a bit later, but those guys appreciate a ton of value. And since they're so young, they carry a lot of weight. Like a lot of people have A.J. Brown like well, with, well within like their top 10, top 8. Some people within their top 5 overall dynasty receivers and if you're going to trade that away for julio jones just because it's a known commodity then you definitely lose that trade because even from last year this year julio lost value he was like a third round startup pick to like a sixth round or whatever next year it's probably like a seventh round because he gets a year older whereas aj brown is only moving up the draft board so you want to leverage your situation to help you not only now but also in the future yep definitely i'll say that this year in particular the second round is so fucking deep. Like I'm, I'm in drafts this year and I'm getting guys like LaVisca Chanel who would probably go in the first round in normal draft in like the back part of the second. And like, so when you're, when you have a lot of second round picks, that's when you can start looking to flip a veterans. Like people are going to really love some of these players that are falling and you can get like, you know, the Jarvis Landry's, the Robert Woods, like the guys that aren't necessarily sexy, but are going to produce for you right away for contending team. Yeah. So, and just, I'm on the clock right now at the 205. Some of the names that are still there, T. Higgins, Michael Pittman, Brandon Ayuk, LaVisca Chanel, Zach Moss, Brian Edwards, Antonio Gibson. Like last year, these guys, a lot of them would have been like the second half of the first round picks. You know, Dude, probably last year, early. people were drafting freaking Darwin Thompson in the second round. Okay. They were drafting Darwin Thompson. Yeah, I remember like- Daryl Henderson went up to like the 110, <laughs> 11 because Todd yeah. Gurley's knee was like diagnosed or something. <laughs> yeah. So that's how you know it's like a totally different class. So if you want to take advantage of this year, go for it. But I, I wouldn't like just don't take absolutes, right? I think people in fantasy too often, they're like, I must do this or I must do that. Like just try and find like a good balance um, in, in what you do. Yeah. I think it's a good way to wrap up this episode talking all about how to start a dynasty, how to trade rookie picks or whatever. 
as I said before, if you guys have any questions, hit us up down in the comments. We're very happy to help. Sign up for the Discord. Uh, purchase the draft guide, bigdogsdraftguide.com slash MKF. You can get it for, I believe, $10 if you're a first-time depositor on Monkey Knife Fight. I'm sure you can work around it if you aren't a first-time depositor. You're going to have to look into that. I think it's like 37 <laughs> states that allow it. So um, I think that's all we got for you guys. We don't know the content coming next week. It might be a Q&A on our Discord. So if you want to ask us more questions, be featured. Definitely sign up for the Discord completely free. Link down below. Linked in the comments. Linked everywhere you see our faces on Twitter, here, wherever. Um, I think that's about it. Thanks.